Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jonathan Hernandez from Mexico, chair of the IFLAS Advisory Committee on Freedom of Access to Information and Freedom of Expression, FAVE, and welcome to this webinar commemorating Banet Books Week. For many years now, IFLA and library associations around the world have joined this important initiative by ALA, launched in 1982 in response to a sudden surge in the number of challenges in libraries, bookstores, and schools. Banet Books Week is also a time to support libraries and librarians. Librarians, as you know, are um, often on the front line of the fight against censorship, and they play a vital role in ensuring that everyone has access to information and ideas, regardless of their viewpoint. So today, we are going to discuss access to information under siege across the world, as well as best practices and strategies from library associations and librarians. And we call this webinar Rescuing Our World from the Harms of Censorship, Providing Access to Information in Unprecedented Times. And uh, it should be known that uh, this is a collaboration between IFLAS Management of Library Association Section, MLIS, and IFLAS Advisory Committee on Freedom of Access to Information and Freedom of Expression, FAVE. And in this regard, Banet Books Week is significant to FAVE because it is a time to celebrate the freedom to read and to draw attention to the dangers of censorship. The heart of FAVE mission is to promote intellectual freedom and achieve the vital mission of supporting libraries in their role as getaway to knowledge and ideas. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. I am seeing uh, your comments. Hello for uh, to everybody and to many parts of the world. This is really good. And I'd like to introduce you to Loida Garcia Febo, chair of IFLA MLIS, and who will give us an overview of the current situation in different regions of the world, followed by our speaker intervention and a Q&A. So feel free to uh, put your comments or your question in the chat. Thank you very much, everyone, and please enjoy the webinar. Loira. Thank you, Jonathan, and welcome again, everybody from so many countries around the world that we are seeing on the chat. I will share my screen now. Yes, so this is our theme for today, and um, we are very happy to moderate uh, the program today, Jonathan and I. And here we have the most recent picture of the Management of Library Association section at the IFLA Congress in Rotterdam. MLIS, uh, as it is known, sponsored the IFLA New Professional Special Interest Group and the IFLA Women Information and Library Special Interest Group. And now I would like to share some news from MLIS before moving on to the theme of today's webinar. I would like to encourage everyone to check out MLIS YouTube channel to watch our advocacy video series featuring interviews of library leaders in all IFLA languages, our webinar series on leadership and diversity featuring all regions of the world. And you can read about it on the um, blog site of the management and marketing section. Also on the MLAS YouTube, our webinar series on SDGs, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and Library Associations. And you can read about MLAS at Impact Advocacy Evaluation Project on our website. And our work with the EFLAT regions is also on the EFLA um, newsletter and on the website. You can stay updated by following um, MLAS Twitter or X now, uh, Facebook, and also you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. MLAS and FAITH are in agreement that now more than ever, we must uphold the principles conveyed by the Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right 
includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Different countries around the world ban different materials. Here is a snapshot of countries with recent book banning incidents. You can see they are in North America, South America, um, Asia, Oceania, um, in Europe as well. And they are different countries. These are the most recent ones. Before we continue, I would like to make a distinction between banning books and challenging books. Banning a book is the removal of materials, for example, books, graphic novels, textbooks from collections. A challenge is an attempt to remove or restrict materials based upon the objections of a person or a group. A banning is the removal of those materials. And you may hear these two terms during this event. Although book bannings are happening in different countries around the world, library associations and librarians are uniting efforts with communities to celebrate the freedom to read and continue providing access to information and to books and services featuring different topics. Now I will share highlights from countries that have answered our call for information about their efforts to support the freedom to read. CILIP in the UK just published a guide entitled Managing Safe and Inclusive Public Library Services, a practical guide. The 52 page guide is intended primarily for public librarians and staff who make decisions around stock, public internet access, use of space and public programming. The guide also includes references to good practice for library services in schools and prisons, and its key principles can be applied across all library contexts. Information in the guide definitely promotes the freedom to read and it is a useful document to review. In Germany, diversity and dialogue in the library. The Library Association DBV has a project in cooperation with the Federal Agency for Civic Education to support libraries and their employees in implementing formats for democracy, education, and promoting dialogue. Libraries strengthen our democracy with their work, well anchored in village and city society discussions from this project can be held on different points of view and it seeks to strengthen local social cohesion. Our colleagues at the Library Association in Germany also share a handle from the Mobile Advice Against Right-Wing Extremism Berlin. It offers numerous tips for practice on how to create a democratic model, how to confidently deal with extreme right-wing media in the collections, how to carry out events without disruption, and how to deal with hostility. In Canada, the Centre for Free Expression Library Challenges Database provides access to challenges libraries have faced to items in their collections and to displays, programs, room usage, and computer access. For each challenge, the database provides information about the challenge, including the item, the nature of the objection, the requested remedy, and where available the record of the review of the challenge item under, um, undertaken by the library, and also the library's response. The database began with public libraries, but will be expanded to include school libraries, academic, and government libraries. All types of libraries in Canada are encouraged to add their challenges to the database by completing a Google form. In the USA, we are going to have speakers from the USA, but these are very general points. Librarians are frequently on the media, on TV, radio, podcasts, supporting the freedom to read and have been invited by the Senate Judiciary Committee also to provide testimony on the matter. The public library in Hoboken in New Jersey worked together with the city council who voted unanimously to declare Hoboken a sanctuary of books and not banned books. 
Under the Illinois Library System Act, Illinois libraries will only be eligible for state funding if they adhere to the ALA's Library Big um, Bill of Rights. And they also created a, a website, Ban Book Bans. The National Coalition Against Censorship launched a kids' uh, right to read network a network of local groups that host monthly meetings where they share information and resources. And the Band Wagon is an initiative from publishers bringing banned books to cities with high incidence of book banks, and they are going on tour this week. As we can see, library associations and librarians are taking action to support the freedom to read. Now we are going to welcome our speakers who will share information that we hope help others facing book bannings. They will speak about the situation in their countries, how they are managing the crisis and their strategies, how they are building support networks for libraries and librarians, coalition building, and will share, if any, information about legal recourse, which we know varies from country to country. Our speakers are Jenilson Geraldo, member of uh, FAITH, and also representative of FIBAB, the Brazilian Federation of Association of Librarians, Information Scientists, and Institutions. Stuart Hamilton, head libraries development, local government management in Ireland, and a member of the IFLA governing board. Joyce McIntosh, American Library Association, Office for Intellectual Freedom, and Lori Fisher, Maine State Librarian, an ALA Policy Corps member. And Edward McKinnon from Amnesty International Banned Books Week Working Group. And now, without further, to, further ado, I would like to welcome Janusson Geraldo from Brazil. Thank you, Loida, and good morning, everyone. And thank you again for the opportunity to talk a little about the situation of the attempts at censorship in Brazil. And, but I need to apologize that because my English is not very well. I don't use it every day in my life and my natural language is Portuguese. And about that, and so I included some notes from my speech in the presentation to help everyone understand. But if you now understand something, please ask me later, okay? All right, I will share my presentation. All right. Um, Okay, let's start. Uh, well, what I want to talk about today is censorship in Brazil, present in the history, situation, challenge, and current action talking in Brazil to combat censorship of books and access to information. And specifically, I tend to present on a brief history of censorship in Brazil point out the three key factors that I believe are responsible for the fact that we still have a situation of censorship in Brazil, despite the fact that we have national laws, what censorship looks like in Brazil today, what have we done about that, and finally, a little about the lack of access uh, to information and data in Brazil, specifically on FEBAB's Federation, Brazilian Federation participation in the productions of the Spotlight Report on the 2003 Agenda in Brazil, which exposed this and thus considers the censorship of the access to information. All right, um, the, the history of book censorship in Brazil goes back many years but persist even after the 1988 Constitution's ban censorship. And the three key factors contribute uh, to attempts at censorship, polarization society, religious intolerance, and political ideologies. 
and the political and social polarization in Brazil um, directly affects freedoms of expression and the possibility of censorship, especially in books and access to information. In any case, these situations can reduce tolerance and diverge think sometimes causing attempts to censor books and freedom of expression. And about this, it's essential to promote an uh, environment that promotes dialogue and tolerance and respect for different opinions. And libraries play a crucial role in this process ensuring the protections of the freedom of expression. And religions intolerance is in Brazil represent a series of threats to freedom of expression and the possible censorship of books and cultural diversities. As a result, it's end up resulting in discrimination against different religions. It's result in censorship of books has treated the diversity of ideas and dialogue between different opinions, in which it's essential to promote freedom of expression to protect fundamental rights and promote an inclusive and respectful society. And political ideologies in Brazil is, exert uh, a significant influence on freedom of expression it can pose a threat to censorship of books and other forms of uh, culture and information. And political ideology shape the way people perceive and interpret the world, often determine what is acceptable or not in terms of its discourse and ethics productions. And about that in Brazil is it has the potential to train freedom of expression by creating divisions and promote censorship of books and other forms of expression. And the current threat of book censorship and restrict access to information in Brazil is scary. Because uh, as I mentioned before, political and ideologies polarization encourage censorship of sensitive works, limit the diversity of ideas, and the intolerance also has an influence, make them avoid sensitive topics. In addition, uh, groups with specific interests push for censorship affecting cultural diversity. And so it's a, it is crucial that society defends freedom of expression and access to information, specifically in libraries to ensure that uh, uh, diversity of opinions is protected and respected. And how say in the beginning, Brazil has laws that protect, protect freedom of expression but it also contains provisions that make it possible to censor books. As happened in the government of the Brazilian state, which want to remove many books from school libraries in 2020. In addition to views like this one, encourage the burning of specific books, such as that by actor Paulo Coelho. I think every, everyone know Paulo Coelho. And this involves the Brazilian constitution, which guarantees freedom of expression, but admits uh, restrictions to protect other rights, such as privacy and human dignity, as well as the civil and penal codes, which have uh, provisions to deal with uh, issues such as uh, defamation or, and hate speech. In addition, Sorry, I come back. Uh, in addition, Brazilian child protection laws may result in restriction on books, and with this, the uh, debates about the censorship of materials using in LGBTQ and gender education in school, often contested by civil society organization. And what have we done about that? 
after so many acts to attempts uh, at censorship that occur in Brazil, especially during the last government in 2020, our online forum has made it available by Brazilian Federation of Library Associations. So that's librarians from all over Brazil could report cases of uh, censorship that are occurring in, in its library, in its activities, or in its collection. On FEBAB's website, you can find several reports of censorship situation report by Brazilian librarian in 2020. And I shared some stories here. Acts uh, of censorship is committed mainly by users, parents of students, school directors, and often by librarians themselves, like this censorship by religious intolerance. I am going to give everyone a little time to read. Okay. On censorship for political ideologies, reason such as this guy from director of the institution. Okay, and censorship for personal religions and dialogues the reason by heads of libraries and institutions. and reports on censorship on culture intolerance. Censorship committed by students encouraged by their parents. And because of uh, homophobia and intolerance, all right. Well. Uh, with this report, we realize that all Brazil has federal laws that protect libraries. Again, censorship, we know that on a daily basis in different types of libraries, students, users, parents of students, bosses, and even librarians try and often Susan censorship, censoring a lot of books. In this way, it's necessary for national and local associations to provide this space for reports and complaint. So that together you can find solutions, not just one library, but for all. And which actions FEBAB managed to hold num numerous discussion of the subject, debates and specific publication on the find censorship in Brazil, as well as uh, some report situation, forcing division uh, on government. 
and providing book censorship in Brazil, together, of course, with a civil society organization, just like um, I say at the beginning, I comment uh, the work of the Brazilian Federation of Libraries, together with a group from Brazilian civil society in monitoring the 2030 agenda. And the Brazilian Federation is member of the civil society work group calling Brazil GT Agenda 2030 and participating in the preparation of the Spotlight Report, which monitor Brazilian activities with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. You want the most uh, strike facts in the productions of this report is the consume of data and censorship of access to information. Even though Brazil has a specific law that guarantees access to information and data transparency. In this way, it's addition to collaborate in the fight against censorship of books, libraries. FEBAB also actively participated in civil society groups and support of the 2030 agenda, mainly against censorship of access to information. Like uh, as IFLA's intends when support the 2030 agenda and mainly as SDG 16, which aims to guarantee access to information. Okay, that's it. I hope uh, you understood everything. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jenelson, for this presentation and congratulations to FEBAP, the Brazilian Federation, for all the work they have been doing to promote freedom of expression. And these actions definitely encourage librarians and libraries to keep promoting freedom of expression. So thanks again. And uh, don't forget for the audience to uh, post your question or your comment in the chat so we can discuss it later. So now I'd like to introduce you to Joyce McIntosh uh, from the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom and to Lori Fisher, Maine State Librarian and ALA Policy Corps member. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, it is so good to see people from many countries on this call. And I appreciate, Jenelson, how well you shared the ideology behind these challenges. That is much of what we are seeing in the United States and throughout the world. So I appreciated that you um, amplified that. Um, Lori, go ahead and go to our first slide. So in the United States, what we're seeing is a shift, and I call it going from challenges 1.0 to challenges 3.0. Um, oh, is it coming up, Lori, or are you? If need be, I apologize. I it is uh, my computer is not cooperating with me. Every time I try to for go forward on the slide, there we go. I it went okay. to the United Against Book Fans website. Apologies. No worries, but I look forward to sharing that website in a few minutes. <laughs> um, so I feel like we've seen a rapid change or shift over the last 18 months in the United States with our challenges. It used to be one-on-one, -on -one, a parent or somebody would walk into a public library um, or a school library and say, I don't want this. Harry Potter would be a good example. It's witchcraft. I don't want it there would be a conversation between a librarian and the patron, and often they would work out the situation, understanding that our libraries and school library media centers have access for everybody. Then we started seeing the shift from that one-on-one -on -one conversation to organized, well-funded groups bringing multiple challenges at a time, and attempting to circumvent the school or library policies with their challenges um, and not following the proper path to reconsideration. 
And as part of that, we begin seeing disruptions at library programs, people dismantling displays, uh, particularly Pride Month or other displays, um, displays related to race, et cetera. Um, First Amendment audits, when people come into a library, say they have a right to videotape and create an altercation. Uh, and then finally, threats to library workers, um, people having their jobs threatened or their uh, lives threatened, um, which is a dramatic shift. And then finally, we've kind of gone to this third level challenges 3.0, where we're legislating censorship. Various states have opted to try to pass laws limiting content in schools. And it used to be we saw most censorship in our schools. Now we see it equally in our public libraries. The challenging thing here for library workers is that on any day, we need to understand and be prepared to navigate any of these levels of challenges now. Um, Lori, could you go to our next slide? Thank you. This, uh, this is such a dramatic visual and it helps me understand just how rapidly these shifts and changes have occurred. Um, the American Library Association does track challenges and we only have what's reported to us. The many, many challenges that aren't reported or noted aren't included in these numbers. That's where I appreciated Jen Olson's comment as well, that often we don't have the data. So what we do have is remarkable. And in the first eight months of 2023, this rose even more, 20%. The difference between the number of challenges and titles represents that sort of second phase of challenges where groups started posting something online on a website, and then they'd send it like rapid fire through social media around the United States and parents would come and say, here's a list of 200 books. I want them out of the library. All right, next slide, please. I am very glad to note that our judges in the United States have been upholding the First Amendment to the US Constitution have not declared any of these books as being obscene or harmful to minors or pornographic. Um, in fact, uh, I'll share this quote in a minute about that, but I want to note how the American Library Association and the colleagues that we work with are attempting to navigate these challenges and help suppress them. The American Library Association Office for Intellectual Freedom does confidential reporting. That's how we get these statistics. And confidential support. We support any library worker or community member throughout the country who calls and says, I need help with a situation. The Freedom to Read Foundation also does education and advocacy, much in the same way that the American Library Association does, but we have one word that's different, and that is litigation. The Freedom to Read Foundation focuses on First Amendment education, litigation, and advocacy, and as you can imagine, in the last year and a half, we have been very, very busy our litigation efforts have increased dramatically. We partner with groups such as the American Civil Liberties Union, the National Coalition Against Censorship, and many others in writing or joining briefs. Um, our director of the Office for Intellectual Freedom, Deborah Caldwell Stone, shared this quote uh, recently when we joined a brief that helped 
halt a bill in Texas, House Bill 900, that would have prevented students from having access to information. She said, as the Supreme Court has repeatedly recognized school boards and elected officials, including our state legislators, need to comply with longstanding constitutional safeguards when they provide for students' education. So on the legal front, we are thankful for the work of the Freedom to Read Foundation and many others. I want to point out another uh, fund that exists for library workers in the United States, that is the Merit Fund. If somebody is facing discrimination in the workplace or their job is threatened due to their defense of intellectual freedom, they may apply for a grant that could help them retain an attorney. It could help them pay for their housing for a month if they've lost their job. It could help them with medical bills. Um, and if it is not sufficient and they are still seeking employment or still need attorney support, they may apply again. Um, the next thing I want to note is Unite Against Book Bans. If you'll go to our next slide. So um, Unite Against Book Bans celebrated its first birthday in June. This project is a little over a year old now. And leaders through the American Library Association determined that often our school librarians and public librarians cannot shoulder these challenges. They may have their school principal threatening their job. They may have someone saying, you remove this or you're out. Um, so this is an effort for community members to be able to advocate on behalf of libraries. Uh, if you could go ahead to the next slide, please. Unite Against Book Pans is a wonderfully nonpartisan organization. The statistics that we share represent people on all parts of the political spectrum. Um, we now have 100 national organizations joining us. If individuals sign on and they include their zip code of address where they live, we can send them notifications if a librarian in their area needs support, someone to show up at a school board meeting or someone who shows up at a public library board meeting to speak. There is an excellent challenge toolkit that gives those talking points geared very much to community members. Um, and it's, a, it's become a great grassroots organizing tool with, as I mentioned, some larger organizational support. So these are all fronts that I will mention, and I will now turn it over to Lori to explain some of the other uh, projects going on in the United States. Thank you, Joyce, and thank you everyone for attending today and for allowing me to share a little bit of what my experience is as not just a librarian in the US, but I am a state librarian for Maine, uh, one of 53 uh, state librarians in the United States. And I have a unique perspective in some ways because I work with librarians of all types across my state and through ALA, the American Library Association. I also work with librarians of all types across the nation because I'm part of ALA's policy core, which I will talk about towards the end of my remarks. First, I wanted to just dive into a little bit about state legislation against book bans. Uh, Lloyd mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation. Illinois did become the first state in the U.S. to pass a law to disincentivize book bans in June. A number of other states are going to attempt to pass similar laws. New Jersey and Massachusetts are at the top of the list. Uh, but there are issues around how this is going forward. And particularly, I can speak to my situation here in Maine. In Maine, we do not provide direct state funding to our public libraries. So we would not be able to have a successful law 
such as Illinois has put forward because they tie their state funding to the uh, adherence to the Library Bill of Rights by public libraries. Since we don't have that sort of carrot and stick, uh, we're at a little bit of a disadvantage in trying to figure out how could we have a, uh, a, a ban the book bans law on the books. I know there are some uh, legislators in the main legislator interested, legislature interested in moving forward, but I know it's a little bit problematic when there's no incentive to actually adhere to the law. <laughs> so um, I also want to mention that state laws being proposed across the nation um, on various aspects of book banning and book challenging are rampant. Uh, in this past legislative session in Maine, we had three particular laws proposed. One was to um, remove the exclusion uh, uh, language out of the obscenity legislation in Maine that would allow librarians and teachers to be criminally charged if they distributed or uh, facilitated use of books that uh, were deemed obscene. We have not had any books deemed obscene in our state and that uh, bill did fail. Another bill proposed a school rating system for libraries. Uh, which in and of itself is is a form of censorship uh, because ratings, who are, what are you basing that on? And ALA has a really great uh, interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights on this issue. Again, this bill did fail. It was voted not ought not to pass. And the last one was to remove any references to uh, and this is in schools and affected school libraries, uh, any references to um, uh, uh, social emotional learning, um, critical race theory, um, any any kind of uh, race or gender uh, uh, basically mention in a lot of their curriculum. And that failed as well. So this past legislative session has been was mainly about school libraries and and curriculum and schools. We, I believe that what we're going to see going forward, especially based on the statistics that Joyce mentioned for the beginning of 2023, where 49% of the challenges we've seen this year relate to public libraries, which is quite the increase over 2022, that we're going to see more legislation proposed that would affect public libraries across our states. What are we doing to manage and build support? Basically, support in our U.S. communities is locally driven. And what, as I mentioned before, what works in one state, county, community will not necessarily work in another. So it is challenging on a national level to coordinate, but we can provide uh, a myriad of solutions that I think that's what it's important for librarians and stakeholders to realize is that it's a not one size fits all solution. We have to work within the environment we're in. Proactive relationship building and communication are key. Uh, that is something I have been stressing for over two years now with all of our librarians, uh, both in New Hampshire and in Maine. And paying attention to who your supporters are and cultivating those relationships. And the thing I'd like to note about that is that library staff can't do it all. Uh, boards of trustees, friends groups, uh, stakeholders in the community who believe in the freedom of expression and freedom to read really need to be cultivated and they need to step up. They need to speak out at board meetings. They need to speak out when things occur so that the li librarians know they're not alone. Emphasizing the role of the library and the community as a whole for improvement of quality of life, I think this is very key because what's going on here, it really, in the United States, it is a culture war against public education and freedom of access to information. And so we can't allow that to continue without it undermining the, the democracy that we all know and love here. And the last piece is showing support of library staff in both small and large ways. I interact with library staff uh, from small libraries on a daily basis. We, over 70% of our libraries in Maine uh, support and uh, serve a population of under 5,000 people. So they like to know just that people are in their corner, even if it's just to come in and say thank you for, for continuing to to be in the position you're in and to advocate for the freedom to read in our community goes a long way. Uh, and I hear that from librarians on a daily basis. 
So examples of managing and building support. One thing that we're doing here in, a, in Maine and in a lot of states this is happening is really communicating out about having that policy review and revision and communicating that out to stakeholders, all stakeholders, not just the people that um, are directly involved in the library, like the trustees and the friends, but other people in your community, your board of selectmen, your town council, your uh, garden club, your rotary or Kiwanis groups, those nonprofit groups that do service projects. It's very important to get those communicated out so they know there's a process. They know there is a way that if someone does have an objection to a book, there's a process to adhere to. Having a community needs assessment and conversation with stakeholders uh, besides censorship issues, because libraries do so much more in their communities than provide books to people. Sometimes I think our stakeholders in the heat of the moment forget that we do so much more, such as offer broadband and Wi-Fi, workforce development, uh, telehealth opportunities. There's so much that libraries do, and we need to remember to keep having those conversations because communities have other priorities aside from censorship, and we need to make sure we're talking about those. We also need to, and this is something that's hard to do with librarians. I just had attended and spoke at a new director orientation in Maine that emphasized this. Short-term crisis management has to be interspersed with long-term planning and relationship building. And that is a difficult thing to do when you're in crisis mode. So trying to find ways to step out of that crisis mode and look forward. Where do you want your library to be in your community? What do you want your library to be involved with, with other community priorities is really critical now, even despite all the censorship problems that we're facing. Knowledge about governing board operations and public comment prior to a censorship issue. This is super key. Uh, I just attended and spoke at a, uh, a censorship panel last night at the University of Maine. And that was one of the major things that the, the students and the public who attended went away with, because uh, I, I did a little, you know, a little poll, a little interactive thing. And I said, how many of you know when your uh, your public body, such as your school board, has their public comment section in their in their agenda, two people out of thirty raise their hands. So we need to get more education out around preparing to speak to these issues and people who are willing to speak to these issues. Again, it gets back to that relationship building and really cultivating these people to be proactive supporters of the library, not just supporters in they, 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 they support them in their mind, but aren't doing any actions to show that. We are facing a lot of other types of censorship aside from book challenges, uh, like, like was mentioned before, book display items all checked out by one person to prevent community access. We're having program challenges. Uh, there's programming being uh, put out there by a, a gentleman who doesn't feel that story time should include certain uh, LGBTQIA themes and uh, he's trying to get meeting room uses uh, at various libraries to hold story times. We had one occur in Belfast, Maine. It happened without incident because the librarian followed the meeting room policy that was put forth by the board of trustees. So it was a non-event, which was wonderful. There's a lot of, also I just wanna mention there's pressure for state libraries and public libraries to discontinue ALA membership due to perceptions about political ideology. And also there are judicial challenges. An example um, is linked in this slide about Washington, how uh, there was a lawsuit put forward to try to prevent the library from putting a, a, an item on there for their funding and it was uh, dismissed. So we had a win there, but this is the kind of thing that we're gonna face on so many different fronts in the coming legislative session. One of the ways that I am trying to help and that a, a number of my colleagues are is through ALA Policy Corps. This was a group launched in 2017-18 to focus on proactive advocacy for policy issues. Uh, when I started in 2019, the focus was on federal funding, copyright, broadband, uh, ebook licensing. Uh, but now there is a definite focus on intellectual freedom issues, and I am one of a group of policy core members who are doing this kind of work regularly. Um, there's more information through the link on the slide here. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is doing presentations such as this. Uh, it, it's, it's regionally, statewide, nationally, and internationally, just trying to get the word out about how uh, what all the issues are, what we're seeing across the country and facilitating that communication with 
regular library stakeholder groups as well as maybe ones that you wouldn't think are library stakeholder groups um, because we need to garner all the support we can for people to speak up in uh, defense of intellectual freedom. So I thank you for your time today. Here's our contact information if anyone has any questions and I'll turn it back over. Thank you so much, uh, Joyce McIntosh and Laurie Fisher. Um, great uh, strategies shared with us, um, so important. And um, they, we can see that both uh, Jonelson and Laurie and, and, and Joyce share strategies that have worked for their countries. So hopefully our attendees can uh, take this in, analyze them, and then see what works for them as they need them. Now we would like to welcome Edward Mackinnon from Amnesty International and the um, Ban Books Working Group. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, and hopefully that you can see it now. Um, and then you have disappeared. It's always a frustration of um, Zoom. Anyway, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, I um, also want to thank the panelists that came before me. It's a fantastic overview, Jenelson, with, with what's going on in Brazil and drawing forward, as uh, Joyce already mentioned, the ideology behind a lot of book bans um, and so forth. And then uh, Joyce for setting that context of um, book banning 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. Uh, I speak a little bit about that in the work that I do um, in, in my other job uh, as library faculty at Glendale Community College. Um, so let me uh, let me uh, get into this just a little bit here um, and say briefly who I am. Um, so I my name is Ed Ed McKenna. I am library faculty at Glendale Community College in Arizona. Uh, I am a volunteer member of Amnesty International's Banned Book Work Week Working Group. Um, it's a small group of about uh, four volunteers and a, a few Amnesty International staff um, that put together Amnesty International USA's Banned Book Week programming each year. Um, we, uh, uh, I am also, uh, oh, I, I am not a policy expert from Amnesty, although I'm aware of uh, a lot of their policies around freedom of expression. Um, and um, and um, you know, technology and social media issues, which I'll speak to a little bit more um, in later on in the slides. Um, I am, of course, affiliated and I'm aware of the American Library Association and Office of Intellectual Freedom uh, as, um, uh, viewpoints on uh, censorship and promoting access to information and materials within libraries. So I like to draw... Oh, I would also like to say that um, I'm also aware that I am at an academic institution with carries with it some additional privileges that uh, just stepping back to the other slide, um, which carries with it a little bit of um, safety compared to my public library colleagues who are out there on the front lines in the United States really facing uh, what Joyce described the harassment, the, um, the um, police reports being filed against them the threats to their jobs and their persons. Uh, as an academic librarian, I experience uh, very little of that um, at my institution. And I also wanna recognize that I do come at this from the perspective of a cisgendered white male and my perspectives are, are limited um, in that way as well. So one of the things I'd like to draw attention to is that is the history of Banned Books Week. Um, Amnesty, for Amnesty International. As, as already mentioned, Banned Book Week itself was started in about 1982 by the American Library Association and others. It was in 1990, and I have to give a, a shout out to Maine for this, that um, a Amnesty International volunteer in Maine uh, started to, to uh, look around the world and think about how uh, banned books and censorship plays into the international human rights scene. And from 1990 to 2011, that volunteer, Thessel Moreland from Maine, created the banned book materials for Amnesty International. 
Sadly, in 2011, Vessel passed away and there were some intermediate years where, um, you know, people did some Amnesty International Band Book Week work on their own. Uh, I am a faculty advisor for the Amnesty International Student Group at Glendale Community College. We continued to do Band Book Week programming and look at issues of censorship using Amnesty International case materials. In 2018, the we began to reinvigorate in a formal way Amnesty International's Band Book Week programming that was actually sanctioned again from the Amnesty International USA office. And over the last five years, we've seen that program grow. I'd like to draw attention to the slide on the screen. The American Library Association actually awarded uh, Amnesty International um, uh, an award in 2013, noting that Amnesty International's approach to Band Book Week is unique. Rather than focusing on book censorship per se, Amnesty International's approach focused on the logical consequences that would follow when governments are allowed to censor. Beyond the removal of burning books comes the removal and physical harm to authors, jails, journalists, and others. And so that's a lot of what Amnesty International is doing. But I'll step back and talk again about my role as a faculty advisor. These are just some images of some of the events that we've had on campus. And this is the way Amnesty International can, can their programming can intersect with the big picture um, uh, policy and, um, and real life cases that are going on around the world while also bringing the educational mission to institutions, libraries and colleges and universities um, that choose to do some programming around these uh, sorts of issues each uh, September, beginning of the school year in the United States and, and in a lot of places around the world. Um, so what does Amnesty International do for Banned Books Week? I can take a quick look at the, actually, I had it in the chat. Let me see if I can bring that up. Yes, I'll throw it into the uh, the chat, the link to uh, the Band Book Week page, but I'll take a quick look there as well. And Amnesty International looks at focus cases, which I'll look at briefly in just a moment. Um, we provide a lot of resources. Um, toolkits, case sheets, um, persecuted posters, uh, author's posters, um, children's materials, bookmarks that are free to order. Um, we also do some um, uh, activities where you can join online and you can, you can listen in on uh, conversations. There's also other ways to take action that are listed here and social media sharing modules and so forth. So there's a lot there on the Amnesty International uh, page. But while I'm talking about Amnesty International, I also want to take a step back and look at the American Library Association and some of the things that Joyce and um, Joyce has already mentioned. How, uh, and uh, I guess a uh, speaker from Brazil also mentioned the, the uh, attack on, on people that are traditionally marginalized. Uh, and the writings of people uh, from people that that present the voices of traditionally marginalized people, and you can see in 2022 of the top 13, eight of the most challenged titles reflect those voices of traditionally marginalized people. The same sort of thing plays out when we look at Amnesty International cases. So these are the six featured cases uh, this year from Amnesty International. And I won't go into detail on a whole lot of these, but I will say that the journalist from Burundi in the upper left uh, was sentenced to 10 years for expressing critical views, um, talking about refugees and refugee rights um, in Burundi. The individual on the lower left is a Sufi Muslim from Nigeria who shared, um, who is facing death, his on death row for a song circulated on WhatsApp. Sufi Islam is a minority um, sect of Islam in, in Nigeria, and he's facing consequences under international, I mean, under Sharia law. Michelle Racinos is not necessarily a member of a um, marginalized community, but because her, her short stories criticize the uh, authoritarian government in El Salvador, she found her book removed from the Guatemalan Book Fair, um, by order of the government and has faced a lot of 
uh, challenges within our own country. But I'm going to draw a little bit more attention to the upper middle case and talk a little bit about Rahali Duat. She's an ethnographer that collects the stories of the Uyghur people in Central Asia. And if we had a little more time, I would play one of the videos. This is from a textbook that she contributed a chapter to, where she had collected the um, music of Dots, Dostan performance among the Uyghurs. This is an excerpt from that chapter of the text. It has things like study questions in there. The excerpt is dominated by relatively consistent repetitive melodic patterns. Take time to figure out how to form a transcription for drawing these patterns in relation to, to another. But Rahali has been sentenced to life imprisonment in China. And this uh, was just confirmed in late September. And the US State Department issued concern uh, a condemnation of this reported life sentence. So Rahali comes from a minority community within China. And she's been accused of uh, separatism and apparently that carries a life sentence in China. Now, some people say that I, maybe I'm putting up a straw man by just showing the, the textbook work that she does um, or looking around on Google Scholar, you can see the other contributions she's made um, to scholarly literature about uh, Uyghur customs and so forth. And so I'm just pointing out her scholarly work, and maybe she's doing something else that that I'm un unaware of. But in China, the the trial was in secret, and so those don't conform to international standards regarding um, fair trials, and we don't know what the other uh, claims of the Chinese government are. Given the situation in China with respect to the Uyghur, we have to assume that this is part of their effort to diminish um, knowledge of the Uyghur culture. So what can we do? Well, we can take action like Amnesty International does, and we can sign petitions, and we can raise awareness about this. And in libraries, we can actually consider um, buying books and amplifying voices. So in Amnesty International uh, typically creates uh, a, a listing of books where um, that have actually been published by authors who have been Amnesty International cases. Now, this doesn't mean that these authors, that the books that are listed on these on on these sheets or this poster that's uh, displayed here, this doesn't mean that those books were the reason for their censorship. But what these books do is they uplift the voices of those who, who have been targeted for what they publish. So I'm gonna shift gears a minute, whoops. and um, talk a little bit about the, what I call the elephant in the room. Um, this webinar, Rescuing Our World from the Harms of Censorship, Providing Access to Information in Unprecedented Times, one of the prompts was how you or your library associate manage, are managing or managing the crisis. My question is, what is the crisis that we're talking about? So yes, there is a crisis in book bans, but there's another crisis going on in our information world. And that is that many people from both sides of the political spectrum are demanding free expression rights to defend their content while simultaneously advocating to res restrict speech that they don't like. And that's particularly happening in the social media environment. What I'm thinking about in particular, and, and Amnesty International has done some work in this area, and they actually are working on, on some more policy regarding this. Um, what I'm particularly talking about is disinformation, particularly misinformation, yes, but disinformation, particularly harassment, violence against women, advocacy of hatred, propaganda for war or violence. And Amnesty International talks about the role of the surveillance giants, Google and Facebook, in promoting that content that's listed above. And then we have the issue that the speech related to those concepts above is amplified in order to turn online speech into clicks, which translates into dollars or um, economic um, capital remuneration. 
And really this type of amplification leads to legal speech in the context of social media that can be multiplied and amplified in ways that amounts to illegal infringement on the rights of others. So what, how does this re relate um, to banned books? I really think that the relationship between the censoring that's going on and the banning that's going on in Brazil and in the United States and other places in the world rests on the polarization that's been going on um, on social media and that there are important international documents or laws that promote freedom of expression, like we said, Article 19, the International Covenant and Civil and Political Rights, but that these laws also allow for limitations on our expression when certain criteria are met. And so I know that we're running out of time, so I'm gonna leave it there and just say that, um, let me see if I can stop sharing my screen. Oops. Um, I will leave it there and just um, note that Amnesty International has been working on, um, on policies that we hope will um, eventually rein in some of that uh, unfettered speech online in ways that respect human rights and respect um, access to information and people's human right to express themselves while also not causing undue harm in the context of the international framework around other related um, uh, mechanisms for controlling hate speech and so forth. It's a new information world out there. And um, I think we as librarians need to be frank about the tension that exists in speech so that we don't be seen as those people that just talk about banned books, but yet we're concerned about reigning in hate speech and propaganda online, and we might call for limitations there. And we need to have discussions and advocacy around shaping that online world so that we can reduce those polarizations. And then the last thing that I would say is, oh, <laughs> I, I see that we might have some a little bit more time. I, I thought I was running out of time. Um, the last thing that um, I would say is that Amnesty International does do this international programming uh, related to Banned Book Week each year. And we are working as an organization to try to get our international sections, because Amnesty International has sections in uh, different, um, you know, 70 different countries in the world. IFLA obviously has members in um, those 70 countries, probably, and many others. And our Band Book Week working group is really interested in how we can sort of bring those two groups together. Can we get the uh, IFLA national associations to work with Amnesty International on the Band Book Week programming and then also tap into the Band Book, I mean, also tap into the Amnesty International sections that are in those countries so that we can promote access to information. We can raise um, awareness of these books and people that are being censored and the um, and the people that are being imprisoned for what they write. Um, it's a difficult time. It's hard. When I started this, the United States was not listed as an Amnesty International case. When I brought these uh, discussions to um, academic conferences in the in the in the United States, um, the university librarians thought this was a great idea because we could internationalize Banned Book Week and we could talk about the different situations going on around the world and we could bring that level of education and that diverse global education to our campuses. Um, and frankly, a lot of university librarians were um, a little tired of bringing out Brave New World and Huckleberry Finn and uh, the, the, the books that are banned and challenged in uh, public libraries and school libraries, because at the university, it's, a, it's sort of a different setting. But now in the United States, we're seeing those uh, confrontations that have elevated the challenges to our own librarians in the United States to be, a to be an Amnesty International Ban Book Week case when our librarians are being harassed, when our teachers are being harassed, and when our um, uh, there are police reports filed against our librarians. 
Um, it really is a global problem and we need to work together to try and solve these. Thank and you very I'll, much. That, I'll, oh. that I'll stop, yes, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Ed, for this for your presentation. Uh, well, we have covered a lot a lot of material in a short time, so I have some remarks from our discussion. So I will start with uh, with the first one with Jenilson from Brazil, who underlined how we are living on a polarized society in many parts of the world. I mean, this is not exclusive uh, in, in Brazil, and also how ideology can drive censorship. So I think that this is a uh, very Im important to have on mind. And I would like to highlight this initiative from FEBAP, uh, libraries that, uh, that won't shut up, which is a very important uh, initiative. Congratulations, FEBAP. So in the United States, uh, as we've seen, I think that's important uh, to highlight the threats to library workers because this is a real problem, not only in the state, but I think that this is, this is uh, something that we should uh, highlight in, in and have in mind during our work. And the legislative initiative that involved in the, on the one hand, attempts that at laws limiting content, which is very important. And on the other hand, there is there are legislations against book bans. I mean, I didn't know that, so I think that uh, this is a, a really good uh, information. And this is important because as librarians, we should be prepared to advocate on several levels. So I think that your examples are quite significant. And I found interesting the messaging to libraries about how to prepare for a censorship issue and of course that there are other types of censorship aside from book challenges. So thank you very much. And finally, Ed, well, I think that you mentioned another information problems uh, on social on the social media environment that we need to, to think about uh, in a more holistic perspective. I mean, disinformation, propaganda, uh, harassment, and the amplification. There are some aspects that we need to, to have in mind when we talk about book challenges also. And um, well, this is important because Banded Books Week, it's, an, it's also an opportunity to educate people about the books that are being challenged and banned. Many people are unaware of the wide range of books that are being targeted. And they may be surprised to learn that some of their favorite books has been banned somewhere. I mean, I'm thinking about the example from Jenilson, from Paulo Coelho, which is a, a very uh, well-known author in Latin America. And many people uh, know this author and love this author. So I think that this is important also to have on mind. So uh, now, uh, Loida, would you have some comments? Yes, thank you so much, Jonathan, for summarizing the highlights today. And um, yes, the, um, the main goal was to share these perspectives from different countries and um, a snapshot from around the world on book banning. We do know that there are different library services that being, uh, are being impacted by censorship, not only collections where the books are, uh, but also uh, services and um, spaces. Um, so um, unfortunately, and as I said in the beginning, there are different ways of, of banning um, uh, library services in collections and spaces and different countries have different banning. So we should probably have other events to analyze um, that and hear also perspective from different groups. Um, so we have work to do, right? That's some type of homework there. I would like to see if there are any questions. I don't see questions in the chat. And um, if there are anybody with a question or comment, this is a good time to do that. <clears throat> it seems that unfortunately, uh, we might not have one of the speakers that was going to bring a perspective from Ireland. And um, we probably need another program uh, down the road to uh, feature perspective from other countries. Since unfortunately today, uh, 
um, it was it was scheduled, but you know things happened, and um, just today uh, we uh, got the news during the program, so uh, it's very sudden. Um, everything is okay. It's just that one of those things. And um, now probably uh, the best if I don't see uh, questions here, I would like to ask our presenters to have final remarks. Perhaps there is a point about uh, uh, censorship or uh, celebrating books or um, an activity from the library associations they would like to uh, highlight today. And I will start with Janelson. <clears throat> Thank you, Loida. Uh, just I want to say thank you very much for inviting me to a webinar, especially Loida and Jonathan. I am very happy to learn more about actions of our college. And uh, if anyone interested to in learning more about Brazilian Federation works and as uh, access in the report on censorship in, in libraries in Brazil, I'm sharing the link here uh, to FEBAB website in the chat now. I think, okay. And, and there you can find some histories about censorship in Brazil. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And Joyce and Lori. Thank you so much for inviting us. And yes, Jonathan, I would love, love, love to see several more events like this so we can understand what's happening throughout the world. I'm pleased that so many people from different countries have joined us. Um, I would like to note two things uh, in this busy band books week, I've shared several presentations with a variety of groups from educators who teach emerging readers to uh, children's authors and illustrators and to black sororities this week. And what struck me so intensely in those presentations is the impact that censorship is having on our students and our young people in the United States, the books being banned are almost entirely related to content that has race or related to content that have LGBTQ uh, content in them. And when you start removing books from both of those topics in large swaths, not only are you seeing the awful viewpoint discrimination that's taking place, but the fact that these students don't see their lives and their family histories reflected in content. There are groups like First Book that are doing extensive studies on the impact of how wonderful it is when these items are retained, the benefits from having access to these materials, and so I'm hopeful as I see those results. I'm hopeful as I see our judges um, relying on the First Amendment and protecting content. And I encourage people to look at uniteagainstbookbans.org as a template for community advocacy. And I thank Edward for introducing me to a new program. I was not familiar with the Amnesty International Ban Books program. So thank you for that. Lori, do you have additional comments as a wrap up? Just, just two brief ones. One is thank you all presenters and those who are attending. Um, I feel like today I've taken my own advice that I had on the slide earlier, which is to get out of the short-term crisis management and look at the wider picture. Um, because I do feel like as, as the state librarian of Maine, I've been really immersed in a lot of crisis management for a lot of different libraries over the past few months uh, that I've been here. 
and and hearing about what's going on in other countries is so so important to set a context for what's happening in the United States is not happening in a vacuum. And I actually, at the University of Maine uh, panel that I was on last night, when I told people that I was presenting here today, they said, oh, can you do a summary and present and 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 put it on the uh, listserv so we know what's going on in other countries? I said, of course I can. That would be great. So uh, this was really valuable for me. And I just want to end on somewhat of a positive note on something that came out of that panel presentation last night. One of the attendees in the audience was a high school student. And this gets to some of the remarks that you made, Joyce, about the impact of uh, book banning and restrictions on our students and our young people. Um, she came because she was involved in one of the bigger cases in Maine where a school board wanted to ban 81 books uh, from, from a school library. What they ended up doing was um, they didn't ban the books but they put them in a section that was restricted and asked parents to fill out a form at the beginning of this school year uh, to um, allow or not allow their students, their, their children to have access to that. 82% of the parents said, my kid can have access to whatever they want in the library. So to us, that said 82% in that community did not support censorship and their kids can have access to these books. So. To, to us here, that's a lot of hope. And that's the where we hope to continue. So thank you again today for allowing me to present and thank you for presenting all of your different viewpoints. I am going to bring them back to our community here. Thank you so much for that perspective. And now, uh, Ed Mackinon. Thank you. Um, yeah, just gonna echo the, the comments that other people said. I think this has been a fantastic discussion to talk about these issues and to hear, for me, to hear some of the international perspective from Brazil and then uh, have the American Library Association talk about um, in concrete ways, the shifting um, attacks on censorship, book banning 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and some of the remedies that they're offering. Uh, the, I think the two things that I would leave with um, is um, I understand that ALA has a, a privacy week um, each year in the late spring, I think. Um, I think it would be interesting to think about um, elevating that um, programming in libraries um, around the world, really, and really begin to, to think about um, not just our own personal privacy, but uh, the, the human rights harms that are done uh, by the surveillance giants and the model that they use to to capitalize our clicks and our speech um, and how that impacts our human rights because i do think that that does affect all of these book bannings that i think it leads to the book bannings that we're seeing um, and to think about the the role of ampli amplification in speech through the algorithms based on the surveillance that's being done and i think that that's where you might be able to get at some of the regulations that wouldn't actually limit speech. Um, it would be about addressing the amplification models. I don't know, it's still something that's being worked on and, I, and I'm not a policy expert, uh, but I think that there might be a way for us as libraries and librarians um, and library organizations to, to look at that a little bit differently um, or a little bit more in depth. And then the other thing is, is thank you for the American Library Association and the library associations around the world that are calling attention to censorship in those areas, because I think one of the strongest things that we can do with censorship is when we see something that's being banned or challenged or censored to elevate its prominence, to make that book more popular than it ever would have been before. I know today much more about Uyghur culture than I did three weeks ago because I learned about Rahali's Duat's case. I know much more about some of the issues that are going on in Iran because I looked at Tumaj's videos and I read the lyrics and I looked up what I didn't know. I better understand those places in the world from the very people that those governments, from the perspective of the very people that those governments are trying to suppress. So when we read The Hate You Give and we read Brave New World and we read uh, LGBT children's books uh, in the United States, we're elevating those voices. And when we look at those um, people around the world who are in jail because of what they're publishing or are being harassed because of what they're publishing, um, we're providing that bulwark against censorship globally. 
Thank you so much. Thank and, you. and before we move to Jonathan, to remind everyone that the recording of this uh, webinar will be available soon. And we are hoping to gather uh, the slides from the presenters to make them available. And uh, before concluding with Jonathan, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Uh, we know that there are many band books, events around the world. And so uh, it's great that you're joining us at live today. So thank you and uh, big hellos from the Management of Library Associations. So thank you very much for all your uh, perspective. And I think this was a great starting point for addressing these challenges. And we definitely need more events like this uh, with different perspectives. And I'm glad about this collaboration between MLIS and FAITH. And we are looking forward to more collaboration on this uh, important issue. And I see uh, some interest in the chat uh, on having more more webinars, so we will have on mind at the uh, committee. So uh, we just have uh, some discussion. And uh, thank you, Carolina, for your comment. I think this is a very important question. I mean, how can we make sure as a profession we don't accidentally join the censorship advocate thinking we are doing good? I mean, this is a very good question. And we can have some talk. We, have, we can have some discussion later to, to address in this issues. I mean, we will have on mind on faith. So before we all head out, I would like to thank everyone who showed up today. Thanks to our speakers, to IFLA headquarters, to LOIDA, and to uh, both the MLIS and the faith committee. And see you soon. And uh, you just keep uh, posted on social media, the video. Thank you very much and see you all.